So welcome to what we hope will be an interesting and informative presentation on care experienced children and young people. Throughout the course of the presentation, we'll have inputs from a number of colleagues, including shared examples from three different sectors. The aims for this session are to explore why care experience is an equity issue, share examples of promising supportive practice, examine a systems approach via virtual head teacher, provide a care experience children and young people fund overview, and offer you an opportunity to be involved and to share. Now I'll hand over to Janine, Senior Education Officer, who will take us through why care experience children and young people is an equity issue. Next slide, please. Thanks, Eve. If we can just move straight on to the next slide. So, in very simple terms, equity uh, simply is if a child needs more help, they should get more help. And the reason I'm here today is just to reaffirm with you that very often care experienced young people need a lot more help and why that might be the case. So, care experienced youngsters are very much at risk. I've got a little photograph there on the right hand side of not being included as well as they could within education and of course the four pillars of inclusion are present, participating, being supported and achieving and we know from the educational outcomes for care experienced youngsters that they fare more poorly than their peers in all of those areas. We also know on a day-to-day -day basis that um, care experienced young people don't always arrive at school ready to learn. Um, their motivation might be low because of interrupted learning, they've missed parts of classes, they feel that they're falling behind, or they're, they're not in, their well-being is not putting them into a place where they can engage as well as they could in learning. Care experienced youngsters also, are, it's rarely ever that care experience is their only need. Sometimes they may, like any other youngster, have additional support needs in, around their learning. Um, they may be being affected by poverty um, and very often we know some of our care experienced youngsters are also young carers. Care experienced youngsters also perhaps have less social capital than their peers. Um, they, can, they can feel the impact of exclusion and marginalisation and that could be because they maybe um, have um, social and emotional and behavioural needs that are different to their peer group because of trauma, adversity in their lives, um, just a disruption living within chaos, um, maybe uh, they experience poor parental capacity. Um, we also know that they're at risk of um, greater risk of criminalisation than their peer groups, things that would normally be dealt with by the family they may often be passed on towards the, the criminal justice system or the police called in to deal with it. And the, the last thing I want to bring out, uh, around is uh, uh, children's rights, which are not always as clear um, for children uh, that ha have care experience. So next slide, please, Eve. So you may have seen this slide before, I, I use it relatively regularly and, um, and it basically is, is bringing children's rights to the fore and what that really means. So of course we know the whole aspect of universal, unconditional, inalienable, inherent and indivisible. Our young people don't have to earn their rights. Every single young person, regardless of whether they have additional support needs or care experience, have them. Uh, they can't be separated from that child because what one child needs would be different to what another child needs. Um, so we have to see each child in the context of their rights as an individual. Um, we've got the underpinning um, rights there that regardless of what else happens, these are the overriding rights. We've got this very specific ones around education, which can be more difficult to achieve for a care experienced youngster who may be um, bouncing around uh, where they live and potentially that's affecting, or their behaviour is affecting them bouncing around where they are educated as well. But on the right hand side of this slide, I'm bringing this into educational language. What does that mean in terms of safeguarding? What does that mean in terms of their participation in all aspects of the curriculum and school life? 
does it mean that they can engage in a full-time curriculum or do they need something more flexible? Um, what is the whole school experience like? Are they getting a chance to join the clubs, um, etc.? Uh, so, next slide, please, Eve. And I mentioned that this for a care experience job could be slightly more complex because we rarely have to think about in terms of the rights of privacy of information for most of our youngsters within school, but that might be a significant consideration for a care experienced youngsters. Um, the rights of the family and when they get a say with what happens with the young person and the difficulties that might cause between a foster family and a biological family. Um, the right for our young people to join into groups and if they live really far away from where they're educated, do they still have that opportunity? Um, the right to their, their own information and when and when is not that safe for them to have that. Um, they may have suffered from adversity in the past and we have a responsibility to support them around that and their well-being uh, that goes around that and if they've experienced trauma and how that presents itself. And also if they've come into conflict with the law, how do we support those young people? So all of these things create that equity of, uh, issue around care experienced young people. So I'll go on no further and I'm going to pass you straight on to the next speaker. Next slide, please. So thank you, Janine. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking presentation. Now I would like to introduce you to Michael Betancourt from Strathclyde University and Larissa Gordon from Aberdeen City. Thank you. Next slide. Um, my name is Michael Betancourt and I work for Celsius. Celsius is the Centre for Excellence for Children's Care and Protection at the University of Strathclyde. And our aim is to improve the outcomes of all children and young people in need of care and protection. We do this by working alongside a number of different groups, including the virtual school head teacher network that I'm going to talk to you about. In the language of the promise, we hold the hands of those who hold the hands of children and young people. I was a virtual school head in two local authorities in England, and Larissa is a virtual school head um, at Aberdeen City, as well as being seconded to Celsius. Next slide, please. A virtual school is an organisational framework which invites local authorities to think about care experience learners as if they've attended one school. They actually go to bricks and mortar schools in and out of the local authority and the virtual school head or the care experience team has got oversight. Like a physical head teacher, the virtual school head or care experience team hold a list and track progress of all of the kids. Um, they address emerging trends, they're a relentless driver for improvement and they support and challenge in a variety of different ways. The term isn't particularly well known and, and it conjures things about online learning, um, uh, but basically it's a senior officer or team charged with improving attainment, attendance and the longer term outcomes of care experienced young people. Next slide, please. I had five minutes, so I'm trying to do a slide a minute. Um, in terms of the Scottish context, the role of virtual school head um, has existed in England since 2014, where it became statutory. So there are 152 in England um, after a pilot um, concluded that they had impact. The first virtual school head in Scotland, Larissa Gordon, came into post in 2015 and the most recent in this year, 2021. The network is made up of 16 local authorities representing it. we think about 70% of the care experience population and it was established as a recognition that there was a need for a specialist forum to develop co-produced approaches to improving the experience of um, care, care experience young people. The remit of the group has changed and it's evolved but it's to close that implementation gap and deliver on the promise to provide support to to a group of professionals who are in a new and evolving role and to create a safe, reflective place for practitioners working in very different contexts. Next slide, please. So evidence from the limited research that's out there, practice and our own evaluation is remarkably consistent in describing a role that works with every level of the system. If any of you are familiar with Bronfenbrenner, one of the research papers uses this model in particular. Um, it's about change only happening when we consider children holistically. 
and work with every level of the system and pay attention to the relationships between them. And that's what we see virtual school heads doing on a daily basis. They create networks, they bridge gaps between systems, for example, education and social care, school and family. The promise talks about parts of the care system that need to contract, parts that need to expand, and parts that need to trans be transformed. And we think this is a part of the care system that is expanding. Um, but in terms of the nitty gritty of what they do, they offer interventions to children and young people at the centre, they offer support to families, and they work actively with schools. Next slide, please. Every local authority will be on a different journey, and there are bound to be regional differences in approaches um, around the virtual school. But we propose that virtual school heads are inhabiting this space between policy ambition and delivery at that top level. Um, virtual school heads are impacting on corporate parenting ethos in local authorities and in schools. In this med middle policy level, they have filled or are actively filling the gap. When Larissa came into post, there were no policies. She created them. Some virtual heads coming into post may inherit policies and are making them active and, and, and enacting them. And then finally, virtual school heads are offering that additional support and a range of interventions to the learners. And um, case studies that we've done demonstrate that young people are gaining qualifications, going on an entry into employment, getting access to a range of different opportunities, which what would not have happened but for the involvement of the virtual school. So whilst the explicit aim of virtual school head teachers is to raise attainment, we are seeing an emerging evidence base of impact on attitudes and ethos psychological factors, well-being, as well as um, attendance exclusions and all of those other measures. Next slide, please. So to, to summarize, the virtual school head model or the care experience team model is evolving organically in Scotland. There are 16 reps in the network that we support representing around 70% of care experience young people in Scotland. There are a variety of different approaches, different configurations of teams but all are aiming to close that gap and improve education outcomes. We are currently involved in research and evaluation to better understand the role and to evidence the impact that it's having in quite a complex area and in an area that's quite hard to measure. Um, and I guess we just wanted to leave you with some reflections, which, it, which are how might you be working, are you working with your virtual school head teacher or care experience team? If not, how might you on and how might you support them? Thank you very much. That is the end of my presentation. And I think I'm handing over to Deborah and Manda. Um, back to me, I think, for one. Eve, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So just a quick thank you to Michael and Larissa for preparing and presenting such an interesting insight into the role of a virtual head teacher. Now I'd like to hand over to Deborah Lee and Manda Stocks from Stirling Council. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm Deborah, and I'm just going to take you through the kind of beginnings of our journey. Um, I am an educational psychologist, uh, and I'm also a member of the virtual head team um, that uh, Michael has kind of summarised uh, in his previous presentation. Uh, we in Sterling have a number of uh, functions in the virtual head team, and one of these functions uh, includes staff development, which is what we've been asked to speak about today. I'm going to take through the, the kind of why that was, and Manda's going to um, finish us off. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so why did we think that, um, or why do we as a virtual head team support staff development? Um, it's a key priority in, in Stirling to embed the nurture and trauma-informed approaches in our schools. We're also, though, very much guided by the promise um, and the vision that we have that we actively support the development of relationships um, with people within the workforce with um, our care experience community. And to do that, we also have to support our workforce um, and as 
as Michael said there, which was lovely, you know, we hold the hands of those who hold the hands of children. I really like that, Michael. Thank you. Um, so we um, have, as part of that, have funded training in the neurosequential model. We looked at this model because internationally um, it has, over the years, developed a number of positive outcomes. Um, reducing critical incidents and um, it, it's sometimes incidents of um, dysregulation with our young people, increasing attendance um, with our young people and engagement and also improved pupil attainment too. So we thought, well, this is quite up, up our street. And our colleagues and a neighbouring authority as well um, suggested that you know this approach could be easily translated into our Scottish context. So we wanted really to look at closing the attainment gap by increasing our understanding of the complexity of, of trauma um, within our, our schools and our educational establishments. Next slide, please. So what have we done so far? I had previously trained um, in the neurosequential model of education um, and had started and um, introduced that to Amanda's team at Sterling Inclusion Support Service um, and um, went on to train um, the, through the uh, virtual head team doing the neurosequential model of therapeutics, which is a more clinical arm to the neurosequential approach. And the reason for this was because we didn't want to just stop at education. We really wanted to think about that shared approach and introducing the approach to our social care colleagues as well. But within education, um, we uh, knew that just me being trained wasn't enough. So the virtual head team supported uh, seven staff members to complete their training as trainers, uh, which we achieved last summer. We then um, went on to look at a delivery training model. Um, and you'll see throughout from 2020, you know, tw um, sorry, a couple of years ago now, um, we started training in primary schools and in nursery. Um, so far now we have train six primary schools and, and two nurseries within that. And Sterling Inclusion Support Service continue um, in their training and, and their learning as we go along. This year, despite a uh, pandemic, um, schools and educational establishments have really continued to be enthusiastic about this training. We've switched to a virtual delivery of training, which has worked well. We've tightened as well our readiness to training. Um, in terms of having a readiness questionnaire, really thinking with the establishments about their implementation um, so that they see that your training isn't the beyond the end all, it's actually what you do with it, what the implementation plan is going to look like. And, and we continue to support their journey going through that as well. We have a strategy group that also oversees the training demands too. So what have we implemented so far? Next slide, please. So myself with neurosequential model therapeutics, um, which is much more case-based studied, um, we have been involved with social workers um, and a team around the childs to help inform and educational packages. Um, we've also been involved, or I've been involved in um, social work inquiries as well regarding queries of placement um, of young people too. Um, those that have been involved in that work have reported um, a much greater understanding of the why of behaviours behind there, which has helped them with either their assessment um, or indeed matching the, um, the resources and the supports to the needs of, of the young person. Um, supported the creation of more cohesive intervention strategies when uh, feedback had, had mentioned. The next step for that piece of work is to support smaller group of foster carers um, and, um, and really kind of help think about implementation within the care system there. Next slide, please. 
before I pass to Amanda just to talk, she's going to talk about that. I just want to mention that you know, when we talk about our impact, and Amanda, I'm sure you'll agree, this is a journey for us. You know, it really is through Amanda in terms of talking about um, CIS and Sterling Inclusion Support journey. You're like two, two and a half years on from that journey. We have um, this month, we will be able to start reporting on small tests of change that our nursery has completed, a probationer project, uh, also looking at kind of movement in school that have arisen from the neurosequential and education training. Um, but Amanda, she's going to take us through this because you're a couple of years down the journey. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, so, it's still an inclusion support service. We support young people with social, emotional, behavioural needs, and uh, there's a primary base, a secondary base, and an outreach uh, where we support young people within Stirling. And um, you'll see the next slide. Enemy for us has been absolutely transformational. Uh, we've always been a trauma informed practice, but it really has empowered us um, to move further forward within the service. Um, it's meant there's been change, changes in the organisational curriculum delivery. Um, we we have um, active regulation breaks um, throughout the day there's regular dosing um, and it's not just a reactionary um, thing that we're doing now it's actually actually all about proactive regulation breaks what NME has done for us is given us the approach so that we are able to counteract some of this regulation that we see and we do this through the use of rhythmic and repetitive activities and um, we think much more about the rhythm of our curricular day as well um, and and so rhythm is a huge 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 part of it um, NME has helped um, to permeate every part of our of our service um, and and actually one of the most powerful things that we've been able to do um, this year is is able to use it within our outreach team and people in mainstream schools have been able to see the impact of it firsthand uh, and have taken on board those strategies so um, training is fantastic but actually people seeing physically what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis and the improvement that it brings is, is been even more powerful uh, and you can see from the screen there we had uh, a zero zero exclusions last year and I know we've got a week to go but we're at zero exclusions this year um, as well and I feel absolutely confident and um, that would have been unheard of um, a few years ago um, within our setting and within our service because we are working um, with young people who are extremely dysregulated. Um, so it, it's also given us um, a huge advantage during the, the recent pandemic as well as, as our experiences have had to change because of experiences, uh, because of restrictions, sorry, and, and has resources has had to change. Um, it's really, really been an empowering tool um, to um, use with our workforce. They've, they've got an approach to use um, that uh, means that they can then take um, regulation um, even further forward, um, but it's based on sound understanding um, of the brain. Um, we had huge successes with our, with our learners last year. So we, we had two learners who returned to mainstream school on a full-time basis without support and are still doing very well now. We've got another young person in primary returning to mainstream school this year. And um, we've got a secondary, we've got a young person who's been given an unconditional college place despite actually being in, in, in the care system since um, a very young age and being involved in our primary base, then going to residential school and then coming back at our secondary base. He's now had that success of, a, of an unconditional conditional college place. Um, we've also used it as well in order to, uh, to be fully incorporated in our family learning strategy and so we've done sessions um, with um, our families and um, because we know that if they can if parents and carers are able to if we're able to help them then they're able to help the young people um, as well and what we love about this approach is it's, it's non-judgmental it's supportive um, and it can enact change um, so um, we often deal with young people um, who are, are subject to intergenerational tra trauma we've absolutely got the the availability and the possibility to change that um, next slide please so there's a few impact statements there so some from sis and some from the people that we've been working with um, outside in schools as well uh, and the proof really is in the pudding and um, my colleague um, who's actually here today um, as well jen um, sullivan who is one of the other enemy practitioners uh, we wanted to make enemy so in, uh, so visible that it's invisible and that means it had to permeate absolutely every aspect of our schooling from the policies from the staff um, and it's been a really empowering tool because as i said it's not a, a little program that runs with 
six or eight weeks that you've done, you just off and you finish and that's it done. It's an approach that already builds on good practice, um, but it empowers um, staff and, and parents and carers as well because we've done the work with them too um, to move forward. So thank you very much for listening. So thank you to Deborah and Amanda for sharing Stirling Council's Head Teacher Project. It's really exciting work that's that's um, been carried out, out there. And like all the other presenters, it's just a shame we didn't have longer time to hear a wee bit more about it. Very exciting, so thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Ian Burgoyne, Strategic Education Manager from East Ayrshire. Ian, thank you. Thanks very much, Mo. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wonder if we could move the first slide on, please, Eve. Yeah, um, our journey really here began about seven years ago um, with what we called the Flexible Pathway Initiative. It was a, a program where we tried to combine um, uh, classroom learning with a lot of the stuff that young people don't get to see before they're in post school. Um, so things like, you know, meaningful work experience, um, training provision, college, all of these things were kind of bundled into a package for young people, um, which um, we found was a really effective way of engaging those young people who were at real risk of disengagement and uh, basically reintegrating them back into their schools. So we kind of took the learning from that um, to look at our school leavers and transitions for school leavers. And really the learning that we found was that Transitions are much more successful when young people are building relationships with the person and not the service of the organisation. And I think for care experienced young people, that is really, really important. So we tried to look at a way where we could take some of the, the, the things that we got right in the, the FPI, the way that we were able to, you know, the vocational training, the exposure to things, as I say, that wouldn't necessarily be, be, be there for young people before they left school to bring it into a school context. And we now have in Kilmarnock in East Ayrshire um, what we call um, 33 RPM, the DYW Partnership Hub. Um, 33 RPM um, is the name the young people attending there have come up with. They're all, we're also looking now to ask the young people what they want the, the letters R, P and M to stand for because I think it's really important that they look at... Um, these letters and think about what, what the attendance there means to them. So Eve, if you can if you can we look at the video and I'll I'll talk through exactly what what's on offer there. So we wanted to make this a space where young people felt welcome. Um, the, a space where they would be able to learn but in a very relaxed, inclusive um, environment. The space is in two floors. Um, so school pupils are given exclusive access to this space here, the main learning space, um, where, as I say, very different from the traditional classroom. Um, the video conferencing suite um, is really there for care experienced young people to, um, to be able to, to, to participate in things like lab reviews, to catch up with peers for all different sorts of reasons. And importantly, this is a 24 seven space. We're open into the evening and also weekends. The second floor you see here is utilised by employability partners and social work services. At weekends, our colleagues from the intensive support team and social work utilise the space to support care experienced young people. And in the evenings, we have employability sessions with young parents uh, who can benefit through our parental employment support fund. And you can see that the space is large enough for a range of opportunities for young people um, of all ages, uh, for a school cohort, and also for young people who uh, have left school. So this provision is now online, and we have young people attending there um, at present. Um, I hope it gives you an idea of the kind of space we're looking at. Um, and the partnership delivery is a really important part of what we do um, to give that really broad educational experience for young people in senior phase. And as I say, for social work, it gives them a base, a permanent base um, to, um, you know, support young people, care experienced young people, again, using the, the, the um, facilities that, that's there to their own end um, and doing so, um, as I say, on, a, on a, a weekendly basis. 
So that's where we are with the space. Um, uh, at present, we are we have young people coming from all of our schools across East Ayrshire, um, and we have a number of partners already working the second floor, including SDS, Skills Development Scotland, DWP, um, our college colleagues. We have national training providers. All of that is to give young people a really rich experience um, that's, that complements their own school experience. So I hope that gave you a flavour of our work in Kilmarnock. Thank you. Next slide, please, Eve. Thank you. That was a really informative presentation and clearly demonstrates the, the work that's going on to support care experienced children and young people. Now I'm going to hand over to my Education Scotland colleague, Stephen Shields. Thanks very much, Mo. Uh, I'd like to take you through a brief overview of the Care Experienced Children and Young People's Fund. You can find out more about the fund by clicking on the live link in the presentation once it's been shared. The fund is part of the wider Attainment Scotland Fund to be used to improve education outcomes for care experienced children and young people from birth to 26. It's important to note that although funding is set using the number of looked after children in schools, the Care Experience Fund can be used to support not only those who are looked after and accommodated by a local authority, but for any child or young person who has experienced kinship care outside the family home, been supported by social work and looked after at home, in foster or secure care, or who may have been adopted. It can be used to develop or supplement work in primary and secondary schools or to offer support at key points of transition, for example, in entering early years education or moving on to further education or apprenticeships, as we've seen today. The fund is normally administered by a central team in the local authority, usually with education and social work working together to bring a more strategic and holistic approach to supporting the academic and wellbeing needs of children and young people. So you can always seek support from your central team. The fund has been extended into next session with increased flexibility as we recover from the impact of COVID-19 and with an emphasis on data from schools and establishments and the voice of children and young people being used to ensure that the fund, along with the other Attainment Scotland fund streams, is delivering the vital targeted support for care experienced children and young people in education. Thank you very much. I'll now hand you over to my colleague Lorna Harvey, who will take you through the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And, and just before we move on, we're going to have a, an opportunity to share and, and perhaps, you know, interact with, with the presenters as well. Just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody um, who was involved in today's webinar. When um, Eve and Mo and Stephen and myself got together to, to plan this, our brief was Care Experienced Children, Young People and Equity. And we felt it was really important to share with you some examples of practice, some, some practical examples. Great to see the video, Ian, and to hear about the work in, in Stirling, the professional learning and the impact that it has. And also from, from Celsius and the, the virtual head teacher and, and teams networking, uh, all that collaboration um, and work that's going on. So, so, so thank you very much. Thanks also um, to, to Janine from Education Scotland for, for starting us off um, and, and kind of laying the foundation for the rest um, of, of the seminar. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to stop recording um, and move on to a more interactive part of this web webinar. <laughs>